in the sixth chapter of Just Landscapes, I'm still using the E400 camera. It's just the last picture where I progress to the E3. More about that later. The E400 was a four-thirds camera with an optical finder. Therefore, I hadn't as yet progressed to spot metering. I was still using center weighted metering to control exposure. My travels during this period take me from the south coast right up to the Lake District via the Peak District and the Yorkshire Dales. So, let's have a look at the first picture. For several years, I taught photography at the Ernley Concourse. Therefore, I had access to the beach frequently at Bracklesham Bay and West Wittering. Sunsets, of course, was a favourite topic, and here we see one, but I've avoided excessive burnout of the sun by waiting for it to go behind a high cloud, and I think it has worked rather nicely. Much of my work features the big view. That is my commercial requirement. Having said that, I tend to overlook little details like this. Light patterns rippling in the water. And it's quite uh, nice to diverse to this type of subject occasionally. Sadly, and I think this applies to many of us, it's the sort of shot that we would all walk by and not notice. As well as teaching photography at the early concourse, for something like 25 years I led photographic holidays for HF holidays, and many of their hotels are situated in wonderful places, such as here on the shores of don't water. The secret of success in landscape photography is often being in the right place at the right time. Oh boy, did Doe and Bank, the HF Hotel, give that option, in fact, more than an option. It's almost a guarantee that on certain mornings during your stay you get cracking shots like this just waiting to be taken. This is one of my favourite photographs taken in the Lake District, and you might think that it was taken early in the morning. It was not. If memory serves me correctly, it's about half past ten, around to quarter to eleven, and the viewpoint is White Moss Common. May I draw your attention to the lens in use, the 14-54, to which I think was a kit lens that originally came with the E1 camera. And it's a darn good optic, but notice, those of you who are eagle-eyed, that I give the millimeter at 76. So what is happening? Well, it's quite easy. I have coupled this lens to a one4 teleconverter, just to get in a little closer. And indeed, carrying a teleconverter around with you in a pocket is much lighter than another lens. The Castlerigg Stone Circle is a monument just outside Keswick, and it's a very popular place. Finding the right time requires an additional skill, easily sold by going either early in the morning or late in the day. This, of course, is the latter, and it's a fantastic place for atmosphere and views. Incidentally, notice, and I think it applies to all pictures so far, that I am underexposing by two-thirds of a stop. I like to get a bit of extra oomph into the colouring without obvious distortion. And anyway, I don't believe in exposing for the right, particularly when you have photographs of high contrast. We now move from the Lake District National Park to the Yorkshire Dales. And of course, there are many popular areas here too. This one, possibly, and thankfully, is a little less well known. Should I tell you where it is? Well, the Norba boulders are just outside the market town of Settle. 
you might think that somebody with a JCB has plonked those stones on that pedestal. No, that is not the case. We have to go back several thousands of years to the last ice age, where those boulders were brought down the valley by the ice sheet and then deposited on softer limestone. Over many years, of course, that limestone has worn away due to wind and weathering. And so, therefore, these harder rocks sit on the softer limestone as pedestals. And one day, unfortunately, those rocks will topple over. This is another of those landscapes you want to try and visit when nobody else is there. In fact, that is the main path going through the picture there that would take visitors, on foot of course, from the village of Malham to Malham Cove. And I don't think there is anybody there. But of course, in coming late in the day, and not only that during winter, we then see the contours of the former field patterns that used to occupy this area. Malamdale and Malam Cove truly are magical places. If I can refer you back to that footpath which took you up to Malam Cove, if, having got there, you walked up 400 odd steps to the top, and it's really worthwhile, by the way, and then continue for another mile or so northwards, you will eventually, possibly out of breath, come here to Malham Town. It's a very difficult place, I find, to photograph. You're about a thousand feet above sea level. As you can see, there are hills, but they are rather a long way away. And making sense of this landscape is not easy. I hope, I hope, you know, I've solved the problem by having an interesting foreground interest. I hope you will agree that it has worked. Like the previous water shot at West Ichinor in Sussex, another detail or cameo shot, this time of a waterfall, the Linton Falls, and I've used a long shutter speed, a quarter of a second. Although I hand hold all my shots, I would admit on this occasion I am resting the camera on a barrier. Notice that you are forced to use F22, otherwise the picture is going to be overexposed. The sun for this shot had gone behind a cloud. Had the sun come out, increasing the light, this shot would be much more difficult, if not impossible. A lot of thought went into this picture of dead cow parsley. Isn't it amazing how this can be a winning picture in artistic circles, like a camera club, for instance. Anyway, first of all, a lot of nonsense is said by other photographers about four-thirds and micro-four-thirds technology. And one of them is, would you believe, yes, you can't have differential focusing. That's what you've got here. It is certainly possible. Not only that, notice I'm on factor F8, but the fact that I'm on the telephoto end of the lens does reduce depth of field. Keeping to f8, then the background of trees then retain their form. We can see what is there. 5.6 would blur the trees even more, 11 would make them clearer. So it's quite a delicate balancing act using differential focusing, which some photographers say is impossible. This photograph was taken the same day as the last one, I think a little earlier. What fascinated me in this broad landscape was the pattern, the diagonal pattern of the dry stone wall, complemented by the background, and not only that, the mist drifting across the valley. So it certainly was a scene where, again, I was in the right place at the right time, and, well, if I was cheating, 
The hotel is about 400 yards away. At last the E3 arrives, one of the last cameras in the four-thirds technology before we went over to micro four-thirds. And I'm still using that kit lens, the 14 to 54. This is a picture that purely works by patterns. Greatly loved, and I contribute to this quite freely, greatly loved by photographic circles. It did, I think, become picture of the year some years ago, so obviously there's something in the image, and perhaps it's a useful and appropriate image to finish this talk on. It's a fascinating experience to look back on my earlier pictures, and we haven't yet got to micro four thirds. The first Olympus commercial camera wasn't released until 2009, so therefore all of these pictures come before that date, and we've yet to look at the E3 pictures, which will come in the next program at some point in Just Landscapes number 7, which I'm greatly looking forward to, and I hope you will find it interesting too. See you next time.